Hey, hey, welcome back to Pianist Academy. Today, I'm gonna to show you my top tips for practicing Hannon in a healthy way, how to keep it fresh, how to mix it up musically, and how to stay healthy in your technique and your practice as you go through these very, very repetitive exercises. Now, I'm only actually going to work on and play for you exercise one in the book, but all the concepts that we talk about today can be applied to all of the exercises in the book and plenty of musical repertoire that's out there. So. Let's dive in. Okay, the very first thing that we need to think about when approaching Hannon or when approaching any technical exercise that's very repetitive is that we have a very relaxed body and mechanism to play the piano. So while the exercise says to start at metronome quarter note equals 60 as the lowest tempo, I'd actually say let's start far, far slower than that because we want to feel exactly what each note is like as it's depressed and as we shift our energy from note to note. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. So if we start at the very beginning of this exercise, by the way, follow along in your own copy at home. I can't put this music up for copyright reasons. So here we go, very first exercise. This slow. And here's what I'm focusing on. Every note, there's an articulation followed by complete relaxation. The only thing keeping my hands on the keys here is just the simple weight of my arm, my hand holding the key down. I'm not pushing, I'm not forcing it. There's a little bit of an attack followed by complete relaxation, okay? Now, as we change from this note to the next note of the exercise, all we wanna do is have this mental idea of shifting our energy from here Articulation and shift, and shift, and shift, and shift. Every one of these notes is followed by, after this articulation, is followed by complete relaxation in the hand and the arm, everything. So if I just show you this one, the elbow is completely free. The shoulder is completely free. The wrist can move up and down. Even the knuckles have some play in them, okay? So every single note, we maintain this complete ability to move everything around. It's not stuck, right? It's very, very, very important. The only way we can really feel this, identify if we are fully, completely relaxed in the right ways, is to take it this slow. This might be as slow as like 16th note equals 60. It's that slow. I'm not gonna do a whole ton of it for you at that tempo, but just to give you an idea once more, Everything's very relaxed. All I feel is a shift of energy from finger to finger. Now, if we can take this back to metronome quarter note equals 60 for something about like this, I think. And as soon as we take it back to that tempo marking, we still wanna be feeling the same things we felt when it was super slow. Every note has an articulation followed by complete relaxation of the rest of the mechanism. Okay, so that's how it was when it was slow. If we can speed that up. But I'm still feeling that. If I stop halfway between one of these, right here, my hands, they're completely relaxed. I mean, even my, my other fingers and my, and my left hand, they're kind of curled up because that's just the natural position for them. And then they come back out when they need to be played. Okay? So very important. Now we've taken this initial idea of feeling just the right amount of articulation followed by total relaxation, and applied it to the metronome marking of the piece. We can continue to work from that as we get faster and faster and faster. But we're gonna move on for now. The next step is identifying the big, big difference between articulating from only the fingers, which is the primary reason why about half of the teachers in the world steer everybody away from Hannon, is because there's a real tendency to play from only the knuckles down. We don't wanna do that. If we actually only play from these knuckles down and I leave the rest of the mechanism out of the picture, you see there's not a whole lot of dynamic. It's just kind of, it's maybe, maybe mezzo forte. The more of this lifting I do,
I've only done this a short while, and I can feel things. It's not burning yet, but I can feel a little bit of heat in here and a little bit of heat in here. Now, I guarantee you, if I played the rest of the exercise, I would have burning in my upper forearm and maybe some in the top of my hand by the time I finished just exercise one. That is not because I have bad technique. It's because lifting the fingers and coming back down is incredibly unhealthy. So I'm not gonna do any more of that today, okay? Now instead, what I'd like you to do is think about replacing this lifting technique with something else. A lot of times when we play the piano, we want to be using our full body. Piano playing isn't just in the hands, it's not just in the fingers. If you look at a concert pianist of the top, top levels, you can see that they play with everything in their body. They play from their feet, they play from their legs, they play from their back, they play from their shoulders, and they play through the rest of the arm. All you gotta do is look at a concert pianist playing the first chords of the Tchaikovsky first piano concerto, those big D flat chords. When a pianist has to play those with orchestra, you regularly see people coming up out of the bench because the entire body is involved. They're not pushing themselves out with their hands and with their arms. They're actually playing with muscles that are in their legs. Now, let's go back to Hannon. Now that we've established that playing at a really high level requires more body awareness, more muscles being activated, let's start applying that right away. So what I like to think about is articulating every single one of these notes from the elbow. Not from the finger itself, but from the elbow. Let me show you what that looks like first, very slowly, okay? Here we go, I'm starting on middle C this time. One note at a time in super slow motion. Okay, so there's always a little bit of contraction here in the elbow. There's always a little lift. Now if we follow this down, the rest of the mechanism, the wrist is now acting kind of like a cushion. It's just absorbing a little bit of that shock. And then if we have our third part of our mechanism here, the fingers, they're also doing a little bit of an attack, but it's not from a place of height like this. The height is being created by the elbow coming up off the key not by the fingers lifting like this while the elbow is still, okay? Elbow comes up like this. This is, a, this is a lever mechanism, basically, right? And the further away this point is, the more control we have over the mechanism, the more control we have over the lever. That doesn't just mean louder, it also means a lot easier to play softer as well, okay? Now, for example, if we go back and I play this fingers only, I'm pressing, it feels like I'm pressing pretty hard. Like I'm attacking pretty, pretty hard. And I'd say that's mezzo forte at best. Now, if I shift to playing from the elbow. It's actually way easier. It's more crisp articulation and we've gained a dynamic level with no additional effort. It's just three wonderful things that come from this particular motion. Now, if I play a little bit more for you using this motion, starting from the elbow, attacking from the elbow, letting the wrist be a cushion, and then a little bit extra attack from the fingers, but without lifting, this is what it looks like. exercise. I never had an ounce of heat or tension or burning in the top of the hand or in the forearm, all because I changed the point of attack to being from up higher in the mechanism, a larger part of the body. And now that opposed to just playing from the fingers, I didn't even get through half of the exercise. 
and I was already starting to feel some problems building up in the top of the hand and in the forearm. Now, if you continue that the way the book says, you continue that kind of playing for the first exercise, repeating the first exercise, and then going through the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth exercise, which the book says you're supposed to repeat one right after the previous one, I can tell you before you even get through this once, you're going to have a lot of fatigue and a lot of pain in the forearm, in the hand. If you ever, ever have pain while you play, stop immediately. There is no reason to have pain while you play. It's a sign that something is very, very wrong. Don't keep going through it because you are guaranteed to hurt yourself if you have pain. Now, this sensation of kind of burning or heat buildup, it's also not the greatest thing. We don't really want to experience that. But it's a sign that something isn't quite right that we can fix before it's too late. So always pay attention to that too. If you feel burning or you feel that kind of tension building up in your body, in your arms, in your hands, take note of it and try to figure out why is it happening? Where am I holding on to things? What motion is, is not good for me? And if you do have a teacher, be sure and bring it up to them because they are there to help you through that kind of stuff. Okay, so hopefully this new approach to Hannon will change your outlook on the technical side of playing it. But there's more. Part of the large disagreement about whether Hannon is worth it or not to practice is because it is so repetitive. The repetition is, in a way, kind of good for our technique if we practice it healthily. But the repetition can be horrible for musicality. It can be horrible for training our ear. So what I'd like to do today is give you six ideas for how to make hand and exercises more musical. Because we want to engage the ear. Every time we play the piano, every time we play a note at the piano, we want to engage the ear and the auditory part of the brain. We want to be thinking about, listening to, and playing the notes. Every one of those is really important. Sometimes exercises, uh, we tend to tune out, right? We don't really listen to what's going on. We go into this like autopilot mode where whether it's Hannon or scales or there are some other exercises too, and we just play the notes and we just play them in order and we play them at the tempo that is required or whatever. And that is missing a huge, huge part of playing music. And I think every time we sit down at the piano, whether it's playing scales, whether it's playing Hannon, whether it's working on repertoire itself, we should be striving to make a beautiful tone and phrases or something musical. There should be something else going on. So here are six ways that we can make Hannon more musical and keep our ear engaged in the practice of this very repetitive exercise. Those six ways are the one bar swell, the multi bar swell, emphasizing fours with accents, emphasizing fives with accents, large crescendi and decrescendi shapes, and staccato articulations. Now let's go through those one at a time. The one bar swell. What I mean by this is every bar, we're going to have a mini crescendo and a mini decrescendo. So in the case of this, if we look at the ascending part of the exercise, we're gonna make a crescendo up to the highest note, and then we're gonna decrescendo back to the next note of the next bar. It'll sound something like this. You get the idea, right? That's a one bar swell. We can also talk about the multi bar swell. How about we make a crescendo for the first bar and a decrescendo for the second bar. It'll sound something like this. the idea, right? We could take that multi-bar swell and go further. I won't do that with you today, but you could make a multi-bar swell into three bars of crescendo and three bars of decrescendo. Or it could be one bar of crescendo followed by two bars of decrescendo. Or it could be two bars of crescendo followed by one bar of decrescendo. You have all of those options. You don't even have to do them all on one day. You could mix this up and say, well, I'm going to come back to this exercise. Today I'm going to do a one bar crescendo, one bar decrescendo. The next day you come back, maybe do a one bar crescendo, two bars decrescendo, right? And then the next day you come back, mix it up and do something else. Go back to this swell that's within one bar only. So it's half a bar crescendo, half a bar decrescendo. These are all great ways to continue practicing some of this technique. 
but keep our ears engaged and keep listening to what we're making. And in a sense, almost we're making phrases out of this. Now, speaking of phrases, let's talk about accenting the fourth finger. In the ascending part of this exercise, this is working the fourth and fifth fingers of the left hand. The descending part works the fourth and fifth fingers of the right hand. Looking at the ascending part, the fourth finger, the main note that we want to emphasize is the second note of the bar. That one. That one. Right? Okay, now I'm just showing you which note that is. We're not going to take time to emphasize this. What, what we can do is make an accent on that note in the correct hand, left hand ascending, right hand descending. And by doing this, we're in a sense going to create a new phrase. So the phrase is now going to go from the second note of the bar across the bar line to the downbeat. And then we have a new phrase starting on the second note of the bar. And then we shift to thinking about the right hand. get the idea, right? Emphasizing four. So not only are we creating an accent, not only are we shifting the phrase a little bit, but we've actually even created something like a grouping of notes where we're giving our hand, our arm, the mechanism that we use to play, we're giving it an opportunity to rest and reset. So even at fast tempos, we have this place where the articulation is different, right? That's really important. And this idea of grouping and having one landmark or one note in particular that uh, we can make a little different or choose to emphasize, whether it's an accent or even just a mental accent, is going to be not only important for keeping us relaxed in exercises like this and in maybe passage work in music that's faster, but as soon as you start practicing things in octaves, scales in octaves, once you have passages in octaves, <laughs> We got to have places where we can rest and reset in the middle of all of that repetitive, repetitive, repetitive motion. We have to have that point. This is a great way to introduce that. We're emphasizing four, we're shifting the phrase, plus we're giving our body this, this place to reset, regroup, keep going, okay? Now, how about emphasizing five? This time, we're still making a kind of a phrase, except it follows the bar lines exactly. We're still going to be making an accent. We're still going to be um, creating this physical grouping as well, right? And the bonus is this time we also get to work the fifth finger, the other weak finger, the other finger that this exercise is supposed to be helping us with. Here's what it sounds like if I bring out the fifth finger, left hand ascending, right hand descending. Here we go. <laughs> So there was the whole exercise emphasizing five. Again, I'm playing these very quickly, but you can take them at whatever tempo is comfortable for you. My quickness today is only to get through these so that I can show you all of these examples in a relatively short amount of time. That leaves us two more musical ideas to go through. The next one is large crescendos and decrescendos throughout the piece, okay? If we look at the first half, the ascending half of this exercise, it has 14 bars. We could say half of 14 is seven. The first seven bars go through the first octave as we ascend from the initial C that we start on, right? We get to B and then the entire thing repeats. So we have seven bars, then we have seven bars of the same thing repeated an octave higher before we shift directions, okay? So we could say on a large crescendo and decrescendo basis, we could crescendo for seven bars and then we could decrescendo for seven bars. And then we could do the same thing in the descending part of it. Crescendo for the first seven bars, decrescendo for the next seven bars. Here's a little bit of what that would sound like. Starting softly. Crescendo. 
You can get an immense amount of practice trying to make those crescendos and decrescendos as perfect as possible. And if you think that is too easy, let's talk about making one crescendo for 14 bars, the entire ascending part of the exercise, and then one decrescendo for 14 bars, the entire descending part of the exercise. To have all of those notes and to get them precisely lined up, one just a little bit louder than, than the previous and just a little bit louder, over 14 measures of 16th notes, that's incredibly difficult. And we'll give you something so precise to focus on, yet still this very overarching musical idea. So let me show you a little bit of that. Here's 14 bars of crescendo followed by 14 bars of decrescendo. Large crescendi, large decrescendi, they will always be there for you to work out. No matter how advanced you get, no matter how many times you've played hand in, I guarantee it will never be absolutely perfect. So you can always come back to those ideas. The last one today, staccato articulations. Okay, this is pretty self-explanatory. We're going to pull the tempo back a bit and just focus on keeping things relaxed. But instead of legato, staccato. So something like this. It's almost even more detached than staccato. It's not super, super quick, okay? Notice how playing this particular articulation must use the mechanism that starts from the elbow. In order to do this really well, we have to use the technique that we talked about in the first part of this video, the elbow technique. Watch that again. Transition to legato. Back to staccato. Do you see how similar those motions are? Okay, so that's so important that we learn how to do that. That particular technique at the slow tempo is going to translate in so many helpful ways for us. Staccato articulations, one final way to continue to keep this fresh new, keep us thinking in a different way about these notes that are so, so repetitive. All right, that's all for today. I hope if you're a believer in hand and exercises that this has given you some new things to try as you go through and practice them. And if you aren't a believer in hand and exercises, I hope that these ideas give you some hope about ways that we can make this interesting, ways that we can make it musical. As long as we can go about doing this in a healthy way and in always in a musical way, I think these exercises do have value for everybody out there. So I hope you found this helpful today. Be sure and click that thumbs up button. Leave a comment below. Do you have other types of articulations you like to practice? Do you have other musical ways that you've thought about practicing hand in? Leave a comment below. I'd love to hear from you and have a little bit of a discussion about that. As always, remember, practice smarter, not harder. And I'll see you next time you visit Pianist Academy.